a blitzkrieg offensive. As successful as it was surprising, the Ukrainians say it's gone, quote, better than expected. <laughs> and she agrees. Thank you, she says. There's a warm breakfast waiting for you. The flags that fly around Kharkiv are Ukrainian once more. Russian forces, for now, caught by a counteroffensive, this area of northeastern Ukraine, liberated. In just five days, Ukrainian forces have retaken more territory than Russia had taken since April. Mounds of munitions lie left where their owners fled. So swift was the Russian retreat. They didn't even have time to finish their lunches, according to Ukraine's most senior soldier. What these soldiers of social media are documenting, says President Zelensky, could be a defining moment in this six-month-old war. The major offensive had been on Kherson in the south. But since the beginning of the month, Ukrainian forces launched an audacious strike with lightning speed around Kharkiv, capturing an estimated two and a half thousand square kilometers in just a few days. But overnight, they pushed further still, so far north of Kharkiv that troops are just 50 kilometers from the Russian border. In the east and southeast, retaking the villages of Vasilenkovia and Artemyivka. In all, a further 500 square kilometers in just 24 hours, according to Ukraine's most senior commander. And within this territory, the towns of Kubiansk, Balaklia and the region around Izm, areas critical to Russian supply routes. So significant are the losses, a rare admission from the Russian state, though this is a strategic regrouping, not retreat, they claim. Ukraine says thousands of Russian troops have been killed or captured in recent days. All part of a carefully crafted campaign, they say, to lure forces to the south, counter in the north, and confound Russian commanders on the ground too scared to make dynamic decisions. When Ukraine attacked on multiple directions and using very quick decisions, and our commanders on the field, they have a lot of initiative and they are very autonomous. And that is completely opposite to what uh, is in Russian army, which is very rigid and a kind of a Soviet style army. That's why they collapse so quickly, because uh, they just can't react. In Zaporizhia, Europe's largest nuclear power plant has now been, quote, completely stopped. Shelled in recent months, power lines were restored last night, enabling the sixth and final reactor to be shut down. But Ukrainian success has been met with Russian vengeance. Last night, rockets and retribution rained down on Kharkiv. An occupier's reminder, this war is not yet done. Well, the Russian Ministry of Defense claimed today its forces were delivering high-precision strikes against Ukrainian army units in the Kharkiv region. Earlier, I spoke to the Ukrainian MP Maria Mazenseva, who represents Kharkiv city center in the Ukrainian parliament. I began by asking her what she knows about the situation in Kharkiv. Today, we, we are seeing something absolutely incredible, something unprecedented. Ukrainian armed forces and special operations are conducting the liberation um, strategies uh, for around uh, more, more or less than five, six uh, working days. And as a result, 3,000 kilometers of liberated territories and around 40 towns and villages under Ukrainian control with Ukrainian flag in uh, city centers and the towns of the, Sorry, uh, and villages. 40, Why? 40 towns yes. have been retaken by the Ukrainian. 40, 40 towns and villages, 40 towns and villages around that. I'm sure we will know more names and more images coming from that area. Just before our interview, I've received a call from the representatives of Kharkiv Regional Administration confirming 
confirming great news coming from the front line. For Kharkiv as a city has been in the heart of these processes, it's very important to understand that the shelling is ongoing every day. So regardless of the fact that the liberation strategies are working fine, Kharkiv, unfortunately, is witnessing uh, shelling rockets from uh, Belgorod, which is not very far uh, on Russian territory, every day and night. And My constituency, which is city center, was targeted just yesterday with nine missiles. But in the towns where there has been this extraordinary fight back, um, how have the Ukrainian soldiers been received and what have the Russians left behind? Everything they left uh, were, you know, some billboards saying uh, Russia is taking care of you. Uh, local citizens, local Ukrainians are meeting Ukrainian forces with tears. They're literally kissing the hands of um, Ukrainian soldiers. They are uh, shaking, they're crying, they're smiling, they're recording these videos together. Um, ladies are asking if uh, the soldiers want to eat, if they're hungry, if they need any medical assistance. How does that make you feel that these towns, dozens of them, you say, as many as 40, have been liberated? How does that make you feel today? You know, I have I have my relatives there, and uh, okay, it, it's not it's not like the closest one, but Ukrainians' family are, are are usually big and extended. It just made me cry. I was sitting in the plenary hall in Ukrainian Parliament on Tuesday, and I was receiving the first news from the soldiers we are helping, we are in close contact with, and they were telling Maria, "This is not yet public, but we are here. We can tell you that we are now fixing Ukrainian flag instead of the Russian one." I was just smiling, crying. It's a mixed feeling. It's it's just the feeling that something we are aspiring for. Maria, have you been in touch with your relatives? In the towns that have been liberated, what are they saying to you? You have relatives who have been buried at those territories you couldn't access. And, uh, well, now it, you, you know you live in the historical moment and you are trying to, regardless who you are, as President Zelensky said yesterday, we have all became of one profession, which is Ukrainian. A mission is to survive. I think our mission is in helping each other, in, in committing each other to this general uh, line of uh, victory because we don't need peace as it is. We need a victory under Ukrainian conditions and, of course, uh, peace and justice, which will come straight after. Maria Vazenseva, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, earlier I spoke to the eminent war historian, Professor Lawrence Friedman, whose latest book is Command, the Politics and Military Operations from Korea to Ukraine. I began by asking him to give a sense of the scale and significance of the Ukrainian counteroffensive. Well, the scale is, is extraordinary. So it's thousands of kilometres have been liberated in, in a matter of days. Uh, the Russians have been pushed back from uh, areas they, they'd occupied uh, for some time and caught completely by surprise, and they've now acknowledged it and, uh, and pulled out of, of the whole Kharkiv province. Um, it's significant because we really haven't seen anything like this on either side really in, in, in the war up to now, not only a rapid movement forward, but, but also a, a rather bedraggled and hurried and panicky uh, retreat from, from the other side. When Russia retreated a bit uh, in, in March, they did so in a reasonably orderly fashion when they left the area around Kyiv. Uh, but, but, but this is obviously, they've left people behind, they've left equipment behind. It's not a good look. And, and how have they allowed themselves to be humiliated in this way? How has that been possible? Well, I think what happened was um, there's been a well-advertised Ukrainian offensive in Kherson in the south, which is still going on. It, it, it wasn't a feint. Uh, it, it, it's it, it's uh, very important to the Ukrainians. But the Russians diverted a large amount of... Um, uh, of, of force uh, to meet that offensive and in the process they left uh, other areas rather thinly defended so as a result the um, the Ukrainians I mean this wasn't just opportunistic the Ukrainians I think have been preparing for this they were able to develop 
yet another front in Kharkiv and punched through lines which, which, where there were uh, poorly prepared uh, uh, troops in, in insufficient numbers to cope, which were soon um, surrounded and, and, they, and bypassed. So um, I think it, it, it's the, a big strategic error by the Russians, but an error that reflects the, the extent to which they've exhausted a lot of their capabilities and in, in the various efforts they had made with their own offensives over the summer, which hadn't achieved anything like uh, what the uh, Ukrainians have achieved. So could this prove to be a really crucial turning point? Oh, yes. I, I mean, uh, as I've tried to point out, the, 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 um, uh, when, when armies collapse, it can be quite quick. Um, so now the problem that the Russians have got is that uh, the, the areas that are most important to them about which this war was supposedly all about, which is uh, the Donbass, Donetsk and Luhansk, are now much more vulnerable than, than they were before. And if they start, if the Russians start losing chunks of them, then I think Putin is, is in real difficulties. There's already considerable anger. So if, you, if the Russians start losing uh, Donetsk as, uh, and Luhansk as well, or parts of them, uh, then this could cascade. So, um, uh, you know, it's, it's hard to get one's head around the possibility that things could move that quickly to a, to a quick conclusion. But it's to me, it seems as, as likely as this will drag on for some time. Right, so, and a, a conclusion within weeks, potentially. Yeah, I mean, we've got to be careful, obviously. The, the Russians have got a lot of assets in the area. There's an awful lot of territory they hold. Um, so it's a question of how, what momentum the Ukrainians can generate, how quickly the, the Russians can regroup and hold, and what the political dynamic is that, that's been set in motion. So, uh, you know, we've always got to be, be careful about not getting too far ahead of ourselves. But it, it, it's not impossible that, that, that uh, this will bring matters to a conclusion quite quickly. So uh, Ukrainian morale is obviously pretty high at the moment, uh, uh, and they now know that they can achieve what they claim to be able to achieve, but haven't really demonstrated it to, the, to this extent up to now. The Russian morale, by contrast, will be pretty poor. And what, what uh, pressure might that put on Putin now that could contribute to uh, the end of the war? It's, you know, it's hard to know because we we still know so little about decision making in Moscow. How well he's informed, uh, how much he he he, he grasps the enormity of the of the blunder that he is that he has made, and how he can acknowledge this. Uh, whether they'll off, suddenly offer some negotiations to try to manage a more sort of dignified conclusion, or whether they'll. Um, Know, carry on in a state of denial and pretend that they still have things under control. But it, I mean, it can't go on like this. At, at some point, something's got to give. Professor Lawrence Friedman, thank you very much for joining us. Pleasure.